Welcome to, uh, uh, to this next session. Uh, we're going to be talking about the, the new generation of support organizations for entrepreneurs. My name is Josh Moss. I'm editor of Portfolio.com. We're a uh, national business news website that focuses on entrepreneurs, emerging businesses, uh, innovation, and, uh, and some of the folks that we're going to be talking to today are, are definitely in our ballpark and uh, some of the more interesting people that I've met over the past year. Um, uh, I'm going to start it right off and uh, give an introduction for each one of uh, our panelists uh, and then ask them to, to share their, their big idea. Um, and uh, we're going to start uh, over all the way to my, to my far left uh, with, uh, with Ted Gonder. Uh, Ted had his social awakening watching, watching Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth while in high school. That inspired him to launch a statewide climate change awareness campaign and help get him a, uh, a nice scholarship at the University of Chicago. Uh, Ted looked around and saw a need, that entrepreneurship needed to be taught and nurtured in inner cities. He co-founded the group MoneyThink, a nonprofit that empowers urban youth through financial life skills and entrepreneurship. Um, he's got some great stories to tell about, uh, about the kids that he's worked with. Um, uh, he shared some of them with me last night. It was uh, really inspiring stuff. Uh, Ted's also worked with other startups. He spent a summer in Beijing, and he's uh, working to establish his nonprofit MoneyThink as a professional nonprofit that uh, he can lead after graduation. So here's an example of creating your own job uh, while you're in school and, um, uh, and then going to it. Uh, and he's 21 years old. Uh, I'll make a prediction. Ted will probably be the person I've met this weekend who I'll remember the most. So Ted. Uh, why, don't you, uh, why don't you tell us what your big idea is? Thank you, Joshua. Um, so my big idea actually has nothing to do with uh, what I work on or, or what I'm all about, um, but I guess it is today. So um, I, I came up with it a couple hours ago, and I typed it out. Uh, here are a few interesting facts. Alexander the Great was a teenager when he conquered Persia. Thomas Jefferson was 33 when he wrote the Declaration of Independence. Alexander Hamilton was 20 when he joined the U.S. Army, he became a major general at 21, served in Congress until he was 28, was 30 at the Constitutional Convention, and 34 when he was appointed as the first Secretary of the Treasury, where he desi designed our entire American capitalist political superstructure. Pretty impressive. There's no doubt that young people can and do and have changed the world. People are getting together and driving revolutions around the world today. The Arab Spring, we keep talking about at this conference, has been led mostly by people under the age of 35. Our generation is getting impatient with the system, with the old guard. Talented young people are getting together and we're shaking things up. But it's not always pretty. Adversarial organizations and causes might be attracting young people at a dangerous rate. The Tea Party, climate change skeptics, Occupy Wall Street. Uh, Joshua pointed out an interesting irony to me last night that yesterday the Global Social, uh, the Global uh, Social Student, Student, Student Entrepreneurship Awards were outside the New York Stock Exchange yesterday, less than a few hundred feet away from Occupy Wall Street, and you know Occupy DC is just a couple blocks away from this conference. Who's driving the constructive change? Who's getting the media attention? That's the key question here. Finally, as a fourth example of a, an adversarial group that's attracting young people, sort of sucking the marrow out of our future, Al-Qaeda attracts young people by the thousands, by the millions, um, giving them a cause they can believe in. Each of these groups thrives on hate. We don't need any more hate. It's not about politics. It's about solutions. Remember, Martin Luther King Jr. was 25 when he led the Montgomery bus boycott, but he also had folks like Rosa Parks to stand up for what was right. They drove their solutions together. And I mentioned the young prodigies of the American Revolution, the founding fathers. But they worked with people like Benjamin Franklin and George Washington, who were just as old as some of us in this room, modern day baby boomers. Revolution need not be violent or adversarial or overly political. And my generation can't keep falling back on its youth as an excuse to be impatient or disrespectful. At the same time, however, Older generations need to keep open hearts and open minds and work with my generation to accept change that is inevitable, else they'll get hurt and overthrown in the process. Right now, there's a clash of the generations. Let's all grow up a bit 
and have a dialogue of the generations. Thanks, Ed. Uh, you know, I, I, think, uh, I think that's what we're having uh, yesterday, today. Uh, it's been a very interesting conversation. Uh, uh, Sarah, I'm going to go to you next because you're sitting right next to, right next to Ted. Um, uh, you know, this uh, event wouldn't be possible without Sarah Green. Sarah is the co-owner and chief operating officer of Impact, uh, which I love that they keep saying, formerly known as Extreme Entrepreneurship Education. Uh, if you didn't know, uh, Extreme Entrepreneurship Education was named one of Inc.'s 30 under 30 uh, companies uh, for this year. Uh, Sarah graduated from uh, Appalachian State University, North Carolina, where she focused on entrepreneurship and developed a, a real passion for social entrepreneurship. She spent three months in, in uh, Uganda while, uh, while in school teaching about entrepreneurship and microfinancing. For her efforts, ASU named a scholarship after her. Very nice, very impressive. Um, uh, Sarah, uh, uh, I know you're also a serial entrepreneur and you've been involved in other companies. Tell us what your, what your big idea is. Sure, yeah. Um, so yesterday we heard from a lot of, of the top proven leaders in the field of entrepreneurship and they've really paved the way um, and have developed the platform for, for why we're here today. Um, and one of the things that I love the most about entrepreneurship is that the proven, proven methods of what works are constantly changing and growing and adapting. Um, and so with that always comes new challenges and new obstacles that we have to come, uh, have to overcome. So it, it sort of sounds a little strange, but I find it really exciting that your life's mission will never be done. Um, you have to constantly grow, change, and adapt to find a, a solution that's, that's going to go along with all these, these situations that are constantly growing and evolving. Um, so this, this panel is about sharing my grand idea on how we can, how we can return the economy back to full uh, employment status. And um, my idea comes from my journey um, into entrepreneurship myself. So I don't want to go into too much detail there, but I want to focus on the cause and effect um, that actually details the story. So. Um, I didn't know I was an entrepreneur until I started actually winning awards for being an entrepreneur. Um, I thought being an entrepreneur, you had to be someone like Mark Zuckerberg or Steve Jobs. You had to be somebody you know, huge and in the media every day. Um, and I didn't think of it as an actual career path or as something that was attainable to me. I didn't go to school thinking, oh, I'm going to go to school to be an entrepreneur. I thought I'm going to go to school to be a nurse or a doctor or an engineer. Um, and so because of this preconceived notion, I would never have even thought of taking an entrepreneurship class or going to an entrepreneurship event. I wouldn't have even walked in the door. Um, so somewhere along my entrepreneurial journey, my experience with the word entrepreneurship tainted my view of what being entrepreneurial actually was. Um, so um, again, with, with, with not being able to see this as a career path, um, if that's true, then how do you get young people to the point of actually walking in the door. So there's all these great companies out there that, that focus on starting businesses. Um, but what about those who don't even know that they want to start that business yet? How do you get them in the door? Um, how do you actually start entrepreneurs, not start businesses? Um, so if we're really going to be able to return the economy back to this full employment status, we have to get people to actually see entrepreneurship as a career pathway. Um, so my big idea is actually don't teach entrepreneurship before you freak out. <laughs> um, I know it sounds weird that you know co-owner or co-founder of Future of Entrepreneurship Education Summit. I'm saying that, but um, I spent like Josh said, I spent two months or four months in Uganda teaching entrepreneurship, and while I was there, I had this huge paradigm shift. Um, and again, I'm not going to go into detail about that, but every entrepreneur I know has the same experience, has the same paradigm shift that they had in their entrepreneurial journey. Um, that got them to where they are today. Um, and that paradigm shift is what I would consider as to be their first um, conscious exposure to entrepreneurship and the power that it actually entails and the power within themselves. So um, I, I, my whole life mantra is that the greatest waste in the world is the difference between what we are and what we could be. Um, so can you imagine the results if we all lived up to our potential? Um, so to me, entrepreneurship education is helping individuals actually come to that point in the paradigm shift, awaken their goals and their realizations, and then point them in the right direction to the right resources that can actually help them fulfill that passion that's been ignited within themselves. Um, so as evidenced by the people in the room, there are many innovative programs that start businesses, but again, what are we doing to actually start the entrepreneurs? Um, to create the number of jobs that are going to be needed to bring this economy back to full employment status, we have to increase the pool 
um, that we can actually tap into. So we have to expose each and every single young person to the possibilities entrepreneurship can provide, um, help them to experience those paradigm shifts, <coughs> and then again, awaken this potential within their lives to live a life of passion, purpose, and prosperity through the entrepreneurial mindset. So um, again, my idea is to not teach entrepreneurs Great, Sarah. Thank you very much. You know, just to, just as an aside, when I went to college 20 some years ago, I didn't really know anybody who was an entrepreneur who was even thinking in, in that way. We were all on the corporate track in some in some form. I think that you've already achieved a lot of what you're talking about. You can still go a lot further, but um, uh, but there's definitely been a lot of a lot of change already in in that uh, in, in that space. Uh, next to Sarah is. Um, uh, is Anker Jane, uh, and really, who doesn't know Anker? Anyone? Anyone? No. Sorry. <laughs> that was that sort of that sort of that sort of fell flat. Uh, Inc. Magazine calls uh, Anker the best connected 21 21 year old in the world. Um, I'm not fond of hyperbole unless it's uh, portfolio making such statements, but um, I th actually I think that that description is pretty accurate. Uh, Anker's mission is to prioritize di diplomacy by helping young entrepreneurs work uh, across national borders to both develop their own companies and to interact with their peers. Um, he got his formal education from uh, the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. He's a co-founder and CEO of Pangea Company, which uh, helps early stage technology companies and foreign markets accelerate growth into uh, the United States, China, and the Middle East. He's also responsible for bringing young entrepreneurs from around the world, as well as uh, leading business, education, government, and media figures together uh, through the Cairo Society. Uh, I had the honor of going this year uh, to um, uh, to your session in New York, and I have to say it was it was quite possibly the the single best thing I did all year. Wow, so, thank you. Uh, congratulations on that, Anker. What's your big idea? Uh, good morning. Uh, first, I think is to wake up, and then uh, the next step. But uh, so uh, you know, it's, it's fitting being here at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the symbol of American business, and here we are talking about creating jobs and economic growth. But I think to really succeed at doing that. All this hyperbole doesn't make sense. You look back at what made America who we are today. You see, America was built on immigrants. We were built on, the, on people coming here for the American dream. The concept of if you work hard, intellectual capital, the most valuable thing in the world, can be harnessed in this environment to create jobs, create opportunities, create wealth for everyone involved. <clears throat> and yet today, not a single discussion that I've been in have we talked about people outside the United States to create wealth and growth here in the United States. We find ourselves isolating ourselves from the intellectual capital around the world. <clears throat> now there's two ways we can go about that. We can sit here and we can have a weeks long debate on immigration reform and policy and the startup visa and all the crap that we're doing across the street at the White House and the you know, Capitol Hill. Or we can say how does America reinvent itself for the 21st century? How do we reinvent ourselves to be the center, the go-to place for intellectual capital, no matter where it is in the world? Let's, let's return to the values that made us who we are. So in today's world, the most innovative things that I'm seeing, there's lots of innovation in the US, but the most innovative breakthrough ideas I'm seeing that can change the world are being developed by young entrepreneurs in India, in the Middle East, in Chile, in Brazil. Now, if you ask these entrepreneurs, what their number one dream is. It might surprise you to know that the, their dream is to one day open their business and build it to sell into the US market. They may not want to move here and live here, but they would love nothing more than to have their brand be recognized here in the US, the world's largest consumer. Yet ask yourself, how many brands do you guys use today that are Chilean, Indian, Chinese, Brazilian, Saudi, that's not because the innovation doesn't exist. It's because we've built a culture that doesn't allow these breakthrough innovations to enter this market. So here's my idea. What if we, what if American entrepreneurs said, let's go back to our roots. Let's find the best innovation around the world. Let's partner with entrepreneurs outside the United States to launch American businesses in the United States. Let's create these multinational startups or we can take the innovation landlock that exists today and break it down. Let's stop reinventing the same stuff in every country, but let's deploy innovation effectively across borders. Imagine what that does. Imagine if every entrepreneur in the United States could start a company today 
with a new technology, the new idea that can solve problems here in the US because of entrepreneurs that have already developed these solutions outside the United States. We'll be creating jobs right now. America will continue to become the melting pot of the world's greatest intellectual capital without the need for physical transplantation of people. We do this on the internet. Why don't we do it in business? Why don't we do it in entrepreneurship? So ask yourself, how can we, here at the US Chamber of Commerce, redefine America for the 21st century? How can we bring our roots back from being the best of the world to being the best of the world's intellectual capital? And I think in that case, if we do truly, truly embrace that, we will continue to remain the world's economic driver. And that's, uh, that's my little idea. Thanks. Very nice. Uh, and, uh, and last but certainly not least is, uh, is Trevor Owens. Uh, I met uh, Trevor in Orlando at the last uh, summit in February. And I have to be honest, I was a little taken aback because you know he didn't quite look like the others in the room. Uh, uh, he had shaved hair. Trevor, you always look a little different every time I see you. Actually, um, uh, you know what he was involved with was a little bit hard to describe. Uh, and then I found out that he lived in my neighborhood, which was uh, which was nice, but it was uh, it was a little different. Uh, but looks can be deceiving. You know, Trevor is uh, is definitely a new breed of entrepreneur. Um, uh, he went to NYU, but I understand you 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 left NYU, correct? Um, uh, some might call that a dropout. Others would uh, would say it was a, you took an opportunity, uh, and effectively started his own company, the Lean Startup Machine. Uh, before we before any of us had really heard about the whole concept of lean startups, and now it's really all that uh, that we can talk about uh, today through Eric Reese's book and uh, <coughs> through Trevor's work. Um, uh, Trevor is uh, uh, is going around talking a lot about this concept, uh, also building it into a business for himself. Um, uh, Really interesting guy, and uh, I look forward to hearing what your big idea is. Cool. Uh, thank you, Josh, and it's great to be here with all of you, the future innovators of entrepreneurship education. Um, so at Lean Start Machine, we've done 11 events internationally, including in Europe and the Middle East. I've worked with over 500 entrepreneurs and helping them to get their businesses off the ground, working with a lot of the problems that they face, both in the form of psychologically with getting themselves out there and outside their comfort zones and just the basic problems that entrepreneurs face. And um, I want to give you guys sort of three ways that I think entrepreneurship should be taught differently, not only in schools, but in our communities and in internationally. Um, the first one, I think, is that entrepreneurship should be taught outside of the classroom. I don't think that there's any value to really sitting inside of um, a classroom and going through all the strategies. A lot of the classes that we see at NYU, Stanford, MIT, all the best schools, they're, they're stuck in the strategy phase. And a lot of the strategies, um, they become outdated quickly with the, the way the markets change. And entrepreneurs really need to get outside and talk to real customers and get outside out of their comfort zone. Because you end up where you have entrepreneurs that go through their entire education, four years of college, and they've never actually raised any revenue from customers. They've never actually even talked to any of them. And that's one of the biggest challenges that they face is actually standing up, going outside, and talking to customers. It's really difficult, and we need to get more actionable about actually building businesses. The second thing is teaching failure. I think, as like Sarah said, about seeing entrepreneurship as a career path, you have to be comfortable with failing, right? All of the best entrepreneurs, they fail over and over and over again. And it's their perseverance in the end that they come through with a great idea. Um, this is even more difficult internationally. Um, when I was in the Middle East, um, in the U.S., we're able to be pretty honest about our failures here, but we're still, we still fear it. I see a lot of entrepreneurs where they know exactly what they could do to figure out if their idea is not viable and to pivot to a better and more fruitful idea. But it's very hard to actually put your idea to the test in a way that it could fail. And we have to teach that that is a very positive thing. If you go more internationally, failure is not accepted. And that's why entrepreneurship is a very difficult career path abroad, because if you're considered an entrepreneur, you're also considered unemployed. And we have to change this view, not only here in the US, but everywhere in the whole world. Because the world is a globe, global innovation, um, as Ankur was talking about, is the key to success for the human race. Um, the last thing is I think that we need to teach loyalty to our young entrepreneurs. Um, I deal with a lot of young entrepreneurs that they come into the technology scene and they get starstruck by the successful brand name investors, and they forget the people that really helped them 
in their early days, their teachers, their mentors, and these are the people that are really important to their future success and development. And loyalty is not only important for them to the people that help them, but for them to inspire in their employees and in their stakeholders. And without giving loyalty, you cannot understand how to win loyalty. And so those are the three things that I think we need to change about entrepreneurship education. We need to teach entrepreneurship outside of the classroom. We need to teach failure. And we need to teach loyalty. Great. Thank you very much. So I want to start it off with a question, and then we'll, we'll open it up uh, to the audience. Uh, and it's, it's partly because of where we are. We're across the street from the White House, as, uh, as, Anker, as Anker mentioned, and uh, Capitol Hill is, uh, is not too far away. And I wonder, uh, in this time, as, uh, as Congress is trying to fight on how to trim $1.4 trillion, I'm very glad I'm not in that room, uh, mind you, this weekend. Um, uh, as they're trying to do that, does government play a role in supporting entrepreneurship? And if so, what, what might government actually be able to do uh, in terms of supporting your efforts? Who wants, uh, and that's sort of for the, for the panel, so. I'll take it first. So I, I don't think it has to be just government. So one of the big reasons why we're here today is, as Michael was saying this morning, the collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. Um, so I think that in order for the government to be able to actually actually make a dent in um, the recession that's going on, it needs to be something collaborative. We need to have discussions with not just what's going on right now in, in on Capitol Hill and them having discussions amongst themselves with other members of government, but to open it up, have um, have to, people just join the discussions that are from the foundations, that are from higher education, um, that are already successful young entrepreneurs, and actually hear from their perspective what's working, what's not working, and take their advice and actually, um, you know, go with go with what they're saying. I, I got a pretty opinionated uh, perspective so, on somehow this. Somehow I thought you did. <laughs> um, all right. So last weekend, uh, one of the Saudi princes came out to LA to have dinner, and we were talking about what would it take to create an entrepreneurial culture in the Middle East. Okay, and he sat down, and as we were talking, he asked the, the, uh, the big mistake question. How much will it cost to make this happen? <laughs> and my answer was zero. <laughs> we can spend $800 billion right now in the United States. We can spend another $400 billion. Do you, do you know how much money that is? When you think about an entrepreneur starting a company with a quarter million dollars, if you gave that money to you know, two, three million entrepreneurs, if, if every one of them created a job, we'd have more jobs in the United States, one job per, per entrepreneur. We'd have more jobs and we could know what to do with, right? So the real question is not about money. But I said, what if you were to create an environment in the Middle East where entrepreneurs have three things, okay? They need, they need to have recognition. They need to be told that, they need to be able to go home and tell their parents, no, I'm not working at J.P. Morgan or Goldman Sachs, but I'm a national hero. The prince, the king, is recognizing me as a hero of this country, whether I am from here or not. The second thing is they have to have exposure to understand where the opportunities are. And the third thing they need is access. Okay, so now, just imagine if the prince goes back to the Middle East now and says to entrepreneurs around the world, come to Saudi. Every year, we're going to pick 100 young entrepreneurs, and we're going to recognize them in this region as our national heroes. Suddenly, imagine, first of all, how many young people are inspired to try entrepreneurship? But then they say, let me also expose you to the opportunity. Where are the problems that we can solve? We need to create non-energy related businesses. Here are the opportunities. So suddenly you've got ideas. And now for an entrepreneur, one of the most difficult things to do is access. So what if the prince said, here's my Rolodex. We pick 50 entrepreneurs. How can we help you grow your business? Let me open the door to the head of Aramco in North Africa. Let me open the door to Cisco's technology systems in Dubai. That kind of access is invaluable to an entrepreneur. That media exposure, that recognition, that exposure is invaluable. And the amount of capital that will rush to the area to fund these entrepreneurs will be more money than even the Saudi prince could fund. So when we're thinking about America here, whether it's government or whatever, my, my response is, sure, government can play a role. But it's a supporting role. It's not a central role. It's a non-capital role. It's a role to recognize, promote, and open the access doors for entrepreneurs and let them take advantage of it how they see, how they see best. 
Because nothing, no entrepreneur needs anything more than the freedom and the access and the ability to do what they love to do, and they will figure it out. So I think anytime the government tries to tell people how to start companies, create a pathway, this is what the steps you do to take, start a company, or here's the capital, but here are the conditions, and you end up with the wrong kind of entrepreneurs. You end up with bureaucratic entrepreneurs. Ted, uh, so for, uh, uh, for you, uh, sort of following on that, do you, you know, you're, you're in college, you're working on your startup, you're developing your nonprofit, uh, which is also partly a support organization for other entrepreneurs, you know, kind of the, the pay it forward, yeah. ball rolls down. Uh, do you think that that government plays a role? What kind of support that's not there now? Yeah. Would you, either from the private sector, nonprofit sector, uh, public sector, what's not there now that you would like to see? Um, entrepreneurs in government. So that, that would be the first thing, is that I think there's just, you know, in, in academia and in government, I think one of the biggest problems with entrepreneurship education and, and spurring more entrepreneurs is that, like, it, it, there just aren't any entrepreneurs in those positions. Um, I worked at the Kauffman Foundation this summer. Uh, and it was amazing. It was an ama amazing experience. Um, but e even the Kauffman Foundation is still largely run by academics. Um, and I, I, I mean, they, they admit that they'd be much more in touch uh, with the problems that they're trying to solve if they had more in-house entrepreneurs that, that were truly uh, sort of empathetically in touch with what's going on on the ground. Um, but I have a couple other ideas. I totally agree with what Encore was saying, um, that the, the government's role largely is a non-capital one. Um, capital follows talent. That's how ecosystems work. Um, I agree with what Sarah was saying um, and, and with what Encore was saying, that the government, uh, sort of a secondary role for government to play is to highlight the heroes, that there needs to be a hero complex, there needs to be a celebrity culture around entrepreneurship. Um, and I think uh, you know, this is a good first step in the right direction, the Impact 100, um, because those entrepreneurs are, are tweeting, they're going on Facebook, and they're going back to their communities, and people are looking at them as beacons and paragons of inspiration. Um, and so I think the government, the White House, uh, has a lot of prestige that it can offer. It, the real question is, who is it going to highlight? Uh, and then I think my, my big idea on this one uh, is also in line with Encore. Um, but while I was at the Kauffman Foundation, um, I had the opportunity and privilege to go down to Chile for three weeks to do field research uh, and work with the Chilean government on a program that it's doing called Startup Chile, uh, which is brilliant. And that we actually have a two, a two startup entrepreneurs from Chile here today. Um, they're both part of the Startup Chile program, and I got to hang with one of them. Uh, she's awesome. So, but look, I'm in college. I'm a senior at the University of Chicago. Half my friends are getting deported when they graduate because their student visas expire and they want to start companies. It's the University of Chicago. These students have brilliant startup ideas. They're winning business plan competitions across the country, but, when, but they're just developing their idea here, and then they're going to go back to China or India or Singapore or Pakistan and launch it. Is that, like, is that in our interest? Um, and so what Startup Chile is doing is actually the opposite. The, the government has put aside a $40 million fund to attract 1,000 foreign entrepreneurs from all around the world by 2014, and the, the cultural effects, the economic effects are huge. It's $40,000 for potentially thousands of jobs per entrepreneur, uh, and they're, they're putting the infrastructure in place to make it happen. And the best part about it is that the government's relatively hands-off. They have a bunch of private sector on, like entrepreneurs and, and business young people that are running the program and that are sort of loosely reporting to the, the national government. Um, and it was started by a Silicon Valley entrepreneur in Stanford MBA, Nicholas Che. Um, so I, I think putting things in place like that, that that support entrepreneurs, maybe with capital, not much capital, we don't need much capital, capital follows talent, but with space, with Wi-Fi, and with open borders, I think is the number one thing that, that our, our country and governments around the world could do to, to boost entrepreneurship and replicate these ecosystems. And, and one last follow-up for Trevor. Trevor, you know, you're out talking with, with entrepreneurs uh, uh, about uh, uh, about this lean movement, uh, really kind of giving them some new inspiration about how to structure their businesses, what they might be able to do, that they don't have to, to you know, to have everything, that you can start with an idea and, and go from there. What um, uh, are, do you see a need for other kinds of support to help with that? Or do you think that lean startup can accomplish a lot of those things? Yeah, I think there's a, a drastic need for, for more than that. 
I think, um, so my time spent in the Middle East, um, you don't have the community that you have in, say, New York or Silicon Valley. There's not the, there's not sort of the go-to places, like in New York where you can go to a co-working space and you have mentors there. All of the people who have started successful companies are very visible, they're very accessible, they hold office hours, and you just don't have that in other countries. And I think that is key, is really building a community. Um, it's very interesting and innovative what Chile is doing. Um, up until now, there's no country that has successfully created their own tech sector and innovation sector, with the exception of Israel. And what Israel did was dr drastically different than Chile. And um, you know, basically, they just provided some matching funding for investment funds, and then all of these investors that sort of knew how to invest in entrepreneurs and grow their businesses went over to Israel and invested in them. What Chile is doing is sort of a ground-up approach rather than a top-down approach. And it'll be interesting to see if how they can sustain the community, bringing in foreign entrepreneurs. I know Singapore is also doing something similar, offering non-dilutive financing for um, anyone to start a, a company. Even a foreigner can get a, um, you know, a citizenship if they start a company with so much success. But it's really unproven yet, and there's no proven way to create innovation sectors um, internationally. Um, and I think, to an extent, sometimes the government you know, going back to the, the core question, I think sometimes the government can get in the way as well, not as just, um, you know, while they have good intentions, they can also get in the way. And I think, you know, it's important that, um, like we said, we bring the culture of entrepreneurship and the culture of failure that we have here in the U.S. to these other countries because to build an entrepreneurship ecosystem, it's really a 20-year, two-decade process rather than a five-year process. And so it's going to be really interesting to see how this global entrepreneurial renaissance matures and what methods work successfully. Great. Thank you very much. So I'm going to open it up for questions. Uh, we don't have a, a mic here, but it's a fairly small room. So stand, state your name, ask the question. Yell it out. Uh, Zachary Hodges, Houston Community College, Houston Community College. Uh, you used to text. I'd like to make a couple of points and then challenge you. Uh, one is, you know, there's not a more entrepreneurial international city than Houston, Texas. It is emerging as, you know, a city of opportunity uh, where things can happen. Uh, secondly, uh, it's great to talk about the top 2% at Chicago, NYU, Rutgers, uh, uh, the Wharton, uh, but the masses and the grassroots are at the community college, you know, it's in, and in the public schools. So, you know, my challenge to you, and, and we listen, we want all, all the young entrepreneurs we can get in Houston, Texas, <coughs> promise you. So my challenge to you is if you have a good idea about how you could incubate a new program in entrepreneurial education, I'd like to talk to you about how we could make that happen in Houston, Texas. So. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. Everybody have a, a, a response to that? What can you do, what can anybody do to, to incubate, um, uh, as he said, a, 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 a program uh, in, uh, in, in some of these communities? How can you work through the community college system <coughs> to do that, Ted? Yeah, um, I, I frankly think that the sort of entry pathway for entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs, is often just a really exciting event. Um, there, I mean, there are things like Startup Weekend and Lean Startup Machine that, engage, that are, you know, it's 54 hours, 72 hours, super engaging. You meet people that share your same interest, that are having a transformative experience that, where they're building camaraderie and friendship and having paradigm shifts all over the course of a single weekend. Um, I think that's the single largest thing you can do to, to build energy and momentum and sort of kickstart a campus. Um, or a young person's entrepreneurial pathway. You know, you can you can put a kid in a class, but it's it's diluted over the course of 10 weeks or 15 weeks, a semester, a year, um, and it, it might not be meaningful. You know, the immersion I think is key when you're trying to facilitate those paradigm shifts. So talk to Trevor, bring his program to Houston. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, uh, just. Uh, uh, for me, uh, when I've got a new reporter or a new editor working for me, one of the first things I do is I send them to, uh, to an event like this because it's the best opportunity for them to see what's going on uh, in that community to really sort of be um, uh, influenced by the energy that you get. And, uh, and I've, I'm almost forcing them to be overwhelmed by all of the ideas because it can be overwhelming um, in a good way. I mean that uh, positively. Uh, anybody else? Yes.
this is a little bit different from what you guys did to start up your businesses, but I'm wondering how, if we took something like this, we could make it um, interesting to young people. I have folks, uh, you, you went to Appalachian State University, I have folks in my, um, in my community who, who started businesses a generation or two generations ago. In fact, one of them is a winery, a little tiny winery. And I know that this person has communicated to me some of the farms, this winery, some of the you know, insurance businesses, nothing exciting so in, some, in some respects, but they don't have an heir to take over their business. And I know that there are young people who want to stay in the area that, <coughs> I'm trying to figure out how to put this, are not necessarily an originator, but maybe they could take this over. But if, you, if, you go, if I go to somebody in high school and say, hey, you know, what, talk to blah, blah, blah about you know, buying out his business, they go, what? How, how do you take this kind of um, you know, pitch where you, you're, you're turning over mom and pops into people in the community to be a future <coughs> mom and pops? How might I make that conversation interesting to high school students? That's yeah. a great question. question. Um, so I think, first of all, you have, to, you have to explain that that is entrepreneurship. It's just as sexy as starting up your own company. Um, so part of that is recognizing some, some, maybe somebody that's already done it. Um, you know, like Encore was saying, that recognition <laughs> Um, having that cheerleader, having that, wow, I'm, I'm really special, I've done something really cool, is incredibly, um, incredibly important. Um, and then you also have to make, see what you can do to actually make them passionate about it. If they're passionate about the winery, if you find the people that are, that do, are interested in wineries and, and horticulture, um, if, you're, if you find those people, you have to make sure that um, it's a cross-campus initiative and that they know that being an entrepreneur is is a career pathway within that field. Um, and they don't necessarily have to start their own vineyard. Um, but there's these other opportunities out there that, you know, ABC Winery is looking for somebody to take over in a few years, getting them involved them from the beginning um, and, and, and recognizing them as, as being um, one of these heroes in the community to be able to take over that company later. Um, in addition to recognition, I think that um, Providing sort of unique, selective um, opportunities around uh, around these sorts of things uh, could be a really great way of channeling top talent into those positions. So uh, maybe the, there are, there are a lot of students that uh, might want to get jobs elsewhere or do something else. But I, I think that if you're able to maybe create like a scholarship fund or um, do a lot of really heavy marketing around making this sort of apprenticeship experience uh, one of a kind and like a really cool pathway to to all sorts of crazy opportunities, um, and just build a lot of hype and prestige around the op uh, around such a such sort of an internship or apprenticeship, um, you'd get a lot of of really high potential students applying um, and potentially committing once they realize that they that they can excel at that sort of position. And just one more thing about the apprenticeship. Um, or, or, an, or an internship, having them actually take half the time to do work in the business and then half the time on the business and <coughs> encourage them to come up with their own new ideas for how to push forward um, the progress of the company. I, th I, yeah, th I would add one thing. You know, I think that there is, we talk a lot about creating new businesses. I do think that there's a lot about reinventing old businesses yeah. and, um, and taking these ideas both uh, uh, an idea for a business, or you know, in the in the in the uh, passing it off to somebody else, or or nurturing uh, somebody who's an employee to take over a business, and then recreating it, giving it a modern twist, and really making it your own. Anybody else? Yeah. Gotcha. Hi, my name is Britt Bishore. Um So I live in Columbia, Missouri, uh, which is the area that most people fly over between the coasts. Um, and it was interesting listening to uh, Anker talk about uh, uh, you know the, this sort of out migration, forcibly out migration of you know around the world, and it's interesting because I see a lot of parallels with rural America, and uh, so so one I guess my question is, um, do you feel like in order to maximize opportunity, I mean all of you, I think I'm not wrong in this, all of you live in one of the ten biggest cities in the world, right, or in the country, in the country right? Yeah. So, A, do you think that in order to maximize your opportunity, um, do, do you think you right now need to be in a big city? And then second of all, um, if how can we bring the sort of connections? I mean, the, the, the prince of Saudi Arabia hasn't stopped by mid-Missouri recently um, to have dinner. And uh, how can we bring the connections and network of, of opportunities to really, really intelligent people that are doing great things the same way these smart people in India and China and the best and the brightest are in rural America and there's not really an opportunity for them to blossom 
where they're playing it, right? Can I, can I ask a clarifying question? Yeah. Uh, so you're basically saying there's all these really great innovations and really talented people in rural America. How do we highlight what they're doing and help them commercialize, scale, et cetera? Yeah, yeah, that, that is, that's part of the question. The other part of the question is I think a lot of people in rural America don't know what they don't know. Right, so I, it's really tough to be exposed. To, like I'm, I'm listening to all of you up there, and it just it's inspiring, right, to hear what you guys are doing. And I feel like that that there's not a lot of other people. So I'm the only person from like Kansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, basically the giant middle of the country that's at this conference, right? Well, I, I'm saying from a student standpoint, that that's or, or from it from a young entrepreneur standpoint, that's the case. So I, I'm asking sort of how can we get that influence and how can we get that network built in the country as well as out externally out of the country and uh, to maximize opportunity, as you said, Sarah. Um, so I, I think um, to be an entrepreneur, you really have to travel. You have to take advantage of the opportunities, not only in New York, where I'm from, but I travel frequently to San Francisco, Chicago, all the different cities to meet entrepreneurs and investors in those cities. Um, there's a lot going on in the Midwest. Um, in Chicago, Big Omaha is a great conference. Um, and innovation happens everywhere. It doesn't happen in just New York, and it happens in Missouri, too. And, um, if you have the right programs and you have the right community and you bring people, give a reason for people to come there, then you should have no problem. I think um, you should have to think more creatively than maybe we have to do in New York because people are frequently there and it's not much friction for us to ask them to come and talk about their business or to mentor other entrepreneurs. I mean, I, I would say, um, you know, I, I'm, I've always sort of been in urban centers, but uh, when I was first getting plugged into this, like, I'm 21, like, how do you get plugged into a space like this, right? Um, the internet. I, I think that the first step is going on Twitter and going on, just Googling the hell out of, like, everything that comes to mind, like entrepreneurship <coughs> education, social entrepreneurship, getting connected, entrepreneurship conferences, tech conferences, like, type in the city name, see what, see what's there. Um, and maybe maybe it's the role of people in rural areas. Um, I, I think so. Here's how I see it playing out: like people in urban areas and, and suburban areas, major urban centers are putting on these events because they're central locations. There's a geographic advantage that's inherent in the urban landscape. Um, however, I think that if you're in a position of community outreach or entrepreneurship education development or something at a university or, or a, 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 a you know, rural town's mayor's office or something like that, like, do, do the outreach effort. Like, we're, we're doing the, the getting people together effort um, and maybe we can like fly you out or something. Like, there, there's something going on there. But I think that the internet makes it accessible uh, for you to find out about the opportunities. All of this stuff is on Twitter. All of this stuff is on the web. Um, so get plugged in, send an email, and see about fly, like flying or driving a delegation out to the, the nearest cool happenings. Um, I think this is actually a lot more complicating than I think, it's, than I think you're alluding to this, right? I mean, <clears throat> information on pretty much any topic is out there. The problem is that people aren't interested in it, they don't know about it, they don't really care, they're not going to take the time to even bother looking it up even if it's there, right? So I don't, I don't have a solution, which is probably a sh really, you know, bad answer, but I got to ask you before I even think about that, I mean, what are people in this area thinking about when they think about life and they think about like what they care about? I mean, what do, what do people, and I don't, I don't know the answer, I mean, what do people in the middle of the country think about right now? <clears throat> because I can tell you like in, in places like India, I can tell you from like my father's example, you know, coming from a very poor family in India and finding himself as one of the most successful entrepreneurs in the United States, for him it was born out of necessity. You know, when you see problems around, all around you, he didn't think he was being an entrepreneur. He was simply trying to solve his own problems and solve the problems of his family and friends, right? I don't, it's obviously not that dire in the middle of the country, right? But what are people thinking about? Because I think you can use that and leverage that to tie them into this, this world. Uh, I, I, do you have any thoughts on that? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the, the, in terms of the, most people in, in the area are thinking about maybe jobs. I mean, right. I, to, to be honest, the, the, you know, and I'm a little bit different, so I do travel a lot, right? Like, I, I participate in all the social media, and I, so I do a lot of that. Those things. I, I was more. I'm more interested. I'm fascinated with how can I spread my experience. That's been very unusual for my area, you know, amongst other people. And what they are thinking about is they know they want more opportunity. They just don't see clear pathways to doing it. Right. They're, they're not seeing. Uh, they're not doing the stuff that you know, reading the things that they should be sure. reading and doing the things. So a lot of it is, you know, sort of being an evangelist for the the the, the right way of looking at things and, and connecting to the right people. Um, 
I, I just wonder how, how that spread of influence, because I mean, I, I'm connected to Jeff and Big sure. Omaha and all those guys, and, and uh, we're all trying to tackle this problem in, you know, they call it Silicon Prairie, right? Right. Um, yeah. But, uh, um, I, you know, I think that connecting it to this idea of it's not, it's not a job or you're going to, like, be a starving entrepreneur. So I think, I, think I have a proposal for you, and yeah. um, feel free to shut it down. But I think, look... I, Everyone talks about entrepreneurship as in, like, I feel like people talk about, okay, if you want to teach entrepreneurship, you have to teach how to start a company and write a business plan and all this. It's, it's, I mean, that's great, but it's not what really entrepreneurship is about. I mean, you've heard, I'm not the first one to say this this weekend, but entrepreneurship is a mindset. It's a mindset of solving problems, right? It's what Karin's working on right now. So the question really, the reason I asked that earlier question is, what are the problems right now facing the middle of the country? What are the problems that people in their community can identify with? And I wouldn't host entrepreneurship events. I wouldn't because you're not going to attract people to an entrepreneurship event if they don't give a, if they don't give two shits about entrepreneurship, right? They care about the problems around them. So why can't we find out what those? If you want to inspire that culture, find out what the problems are and unite people around those problems. And say, let's create solutions. Those solutions inherently will be businesses. They will be they will be entrepreneurial. And as you start creating solutions, you start creating a community around a certain type of entrepreneur. So Silicon Valley was created around solving these technological computers, hence Silicon Valley, right? LA, there's this whole community right now, you're seeing it grow out of the blue on the west side, Santa Monica, Venice Beach. They're calling it Silicon Beach, yada, 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 right? But the point is, people were looking at different kinds of problems there. It's very much, like, it's very much lifestyle driven. So you're seeing creative recreation, you're seeing like, you know, people creating new ways of t internet TV systems, but that's, that's the culture. So why don't we take a backwards approach? Let's start off finding what the problems that people care about in the middle of the country are. Let's start creating solutions and start attracting people from around the world who care about solving those kinds of so things. If it's agriculture, right? Let's create innovative solutions to agriculture and find the best minds in the world. Say, look, middle of the country is where agriculture happens. If you're interested in this, come here. We will help implement solutions. And before you know it, you've created the agricultural capital of entrepreneurship, which then attracts an ecosystem organically, which then attracts more entrepreneurs. But at no point did you say to yourself, I'm creating an entrepreneurial culture. Right? It's like saying, I'm going to make myself happy. I'm going to find love. Right? You don't do that. You put yourself in the environment to create that organically. Um, and if entrepreneurship is about solving problems, find a problem and attract problem solvers. Awesome. I don't know, that Thanks. Awesome? That's a great point. Yeah. Uh, we've got time for... Uh, have time for a couple more questions. Does anyone have one before I jump in? Yes. Sayed Merkani, Eastern College. Sometimes in business schools and as educators, we try to keep the students in the school as much as possible to get their MBAs because it is more secure. And do you think we are doing a favor to the students by keeping them in the schools and advising them in a way to create a, a secure future, or just we should keep in it, we should look at the issue as a way to allow them to exit from the program and get into entrepreneurship activities. I don't think it's more secure. It's, 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 it's not, <laughs> like, we, like we, we know that now. Um, like all of our parents, at least some of our parents, a lot of my friends' parents lost their jobs, don't have their pensions. Um, and the complacency that they developed over the course of working for an established institution or corporation for 20 plus years is the exact reason that they're now unable to find a job. If you're, going, if you're in business school to get an MBA because you think something's going to be handed to you when you graduate, you're no different from someone who expects a welfare check every single month. Um, so I would say that you, you should advise those who are uh, willing to ask for help and are incubating ideas for their own future, whether they're career goals or product development goals. Entrepreneurship isn't necessarily, uh, again, it's a mindset, right? You can, be, you can be an entrepreneurial investment banker if you have a plan. Um, but I, I think that, uh, that the focus, again, should be on the process and the mindset, not on some end goal, because the, there is no end. The means is the end. Trevor, what a, uh, you're on, on this panel. You started school and then you decided not to not to continue. What was what went through your decision making in that, and uh, and how do you think it's left you? I so I think for, in my case it's very unique, um, and I don't think that I, what I did should be applied to other people. Um, I do think though that specific to MBA problems, there's a, 
there's two things here. There's there's um, sort of the philosophy of it and the practicality of it. I think practically speaking, MBA programs do not prepare people for entrepreneurship, right? They prepare them to be managers in companies. Um, but more philosophically speaking, um, something that really spoke to me is what Steve Jobs said, and that is do what you love and no exceptions. Um, and that's the way that I try to look at things, and that's what I encourage other people to do. Um, just uh, maybe a little follow-up. I think first thing to recognize with that is not everybody needs to be an entrepreneur, right? Uh, I think one of the biggest problems in society today is that we think that everyone has to be Bill Gates, everyone has to be Steve Jobs, and you know what? It's okay to be the best car mechanic or the best plumber in America, you know? But you've got to strive for the best. And so when you're asking yourself, is it the right decision to go to an MBA school, I think there's two things we have to look at. One, what does that person want to achieve, right? And then two, what environment can you provide at the school to allow that person to achieve. So I can tell you right, right now, I'm the least educated person in my family. I have an undergrad degree from, from Wharton. My, both my parents are MBAs, my uncle has two PhDs, my aunt has two PhDs. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm the dumb kid in the family, right? But the, the one thing that I think you, that is missing from the environment of schools that applies to whether they want to be an entrepreneur, a manager, a plumber, no matter what it is, is the opportunity to fail, which is what Trevor was talking about, right? But failing is a unique, I mean, when was the last time you could go to class, try something really ambitious, and fail? They don't allow that. So if you're looking at telling students to come into an MBA, I think you're doing a disservice to anybody you put in your MBA program if you don't let them come into the MBA as a test bed, an experiment for the real world, right? That's what university is about. It's about preparing and testing in your own world. I can, as an undergrad in college, I could screw up over and over and over again, like, sorry, I'm a student, you know? It's a get out of jail free card. And I don't think schools are, uh, are allowing that culture to thrive anymore. So from your perspective, you're gonna say, come into an MBA, it would be because, maybe, hey, look, maybe you're not 100% ready to hit the real world, it's a come take an MBA, and use this two years to find out, A, what you love, and try and fail a couple times, so that by the time you get out, you are prepared. And in that case, if you can tell that to me, I will take your MBA course. But if you can't, then you're wasting my time. Uh, yeah. For me, yeah. so I think I'm, I might be the oldest person on the panel at 24. I graduated in 2009. Um, and a lot of my friends graduated with me height of the economic recession, and they couldn't get a job. So what did they do? They went back to school. And now, it's the end of two years, it's the end of their program, they're graduating, guess what? They still don't have a job, and they're $40,000 in debt. Um, so if they are going to decide to go back to school, one, it can't just be because they have no other options. That should not be the reason that you go back to school. You should go back to school because, you know, if you need your MBA because you want to be a manager. If that's your end goal, that's why you go back to school. Great. We've got time for one, one last one. Where Sarah's a graduate from, so, um, and I actually ethically cannot, I'm to the point where I won't write recommendation letters for my undergrad students wanting to go straight into MBA programs because I feel like, as Sarah said, they're incurring 40,000 more dollars in debt and it's not going to get them anywhere in, in terms of advantages. But in terms of undergraduate education, there's been a number of comments over the last two days um, that I feel as though we're sort of lumping all educators and all universities into the same group. And I appreciated the, the, the gentleman from Houston and the community college making that statement because um, I think we're focusing on sort of the universities we know about, the big, big ivory tower research universities where just like really big business, they can't be innovative. They, they, the system just is not, uh, it doesn't work that way. But if you look at, a number of, of undergraduate universities, particularly in, in community colleges and liberal arts schools and some of the more four-year institutions, I think we are being innovative in the way that we're approaching entrepreneurship education. And I recognize that my most entrepreneurial students are not the ones that are going to be successful in a lecture hall taking multiple choice exams at the end of the day. Um, and so we're finding more creative ways to design classes around practicums and internships and such so that they can be successful. But um, and, and we don't work two days a week, as someone commented yesterday when they asked a question. I wish I had two more days a week to work at this point so I could maybe get a little bit more done. But um, I think what we can do as educators is 
uh, as you were saying, provide the opportunity for failure and or success. So when Sarah was a student, she, she had an idea to plan a large event, some, like this, the global, it was the Global Opportunities Conference. And I think a number of maybe the more bureaucratic large universities would have said, no, we don't see any value in that, um, and would have put roadblocks in her way. I think as educators, the best thing we can do is step out of the way and provide um, the resources and the networks that we bring to the table so that you can, they, the students can get those experiences while they're undergrads so that then now Sarah can come to this uh, type of setting and plan a very successful event. She's been th she had been through it when the stakes were much, much lower. So I just uh, wanted to make that comment because I felt both days that a lot of the universities and kind of comments about educators have been lumped together and are maybe not painting the, the, the full picture, if you will. Josh, before you close, can I say one thing? Yeah, absolutely, Anker. Hey, real quick, before we close, um, this is a this has been a pretty cool weekend. But um, as I've been to probably one too many conferences, and I hope to stop going at some point. Uh, you know, a lot of cool ideas, a lot of cool thoughts. But is there anything that actually is that you guys want to do coming out of this, based on what we've talked about? Because if so, I'd really, really love for you to quickly share it with the group and see if any of us can help you do that. Because there's no point of us sitting here and talking and um, I, you know, all of us just having a cool uh, brain masturbation, right? So uh, any cool ideas that actually want to be implemented based on this that you guys are thinking about? Because I mean, right now is your chance to have a whole room of people ready to put at your disposal and implement. Hey, go. apprenticeship program where high school students can work in a business and work on a business. I think that's important to engage them. But I'd love to get, I'd love to get feedback from you guys about how that program should look, because you know what, who qualifies, what are they doing, you know what, you know, what are the goal, you know what is the outcome, blah blah blah, so because now that I have the idea, I am going to need help to implement it. Find so, any of us during lunch. Yeah. Uh, or, uh, also, that's a that's a that's a great segue. First off, to uh, to thank uh, everybody, Ted, Sarah, Anker, and Trevor for uh, uh, for sharing your ideas with us today. Uh, and also to uh, Trevor, uh, uh, reminded me there is a Lean Startup Machine event. Is it tonight and tomorrow? It's uh, today and tomorrow, yeah. Uh, so if you really want to see some of these uh, uh, actions in, in practice with real entrepreneurs and, and um, uh, in, a, in a real world situation, uh, uh, take part. It's at 1328 Florida Avenue here in the district. Um, uh, see Trevor later. Yeah, just stop by. Great. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it.